So having uh, reviewed the evidence on um, labor market fluctuations over the business cycle, as well as um, on the uh, wage setting institutions, now we're going to try to figure out um, what are possible wage functions that we can use in our matching model. So, um, you remember what we said is that um, wages are set once um, firms and workers get together, once they've been matched. And in that setup, um, both the worker and the firm, they like to find an agreement because it would be costly for them to go back to um, unemployment for the worker and have to wait for a new vacancy to come and... Uh, and, and to end, uh, you know, for a new job to, to come and then enter a new negotiation. It would be also costly for firms to have to repost a new vacancy, reallocate labor to recruiting to fill that vacancy until they find a new worker. So we're in this situation that we call a bilateral monopoly situation, which means that both sides, you know, both sides of the table, both parties have some uh, monopoly power, they have some bargaining power because um, uh, they are facing uh, parties that have something to lose if the negotiation doesn't go through. So the firm has a lot to lose because if they can't find an agreement, they have to uh, spend time finding a new worker. The worker has a lot to lose because if they don't find an agreement, they have to go back to unemployment. So both of these, uh, both of the parties have something to lose, and as a result, both of the parties have some. Uh, hold some power over uh, the other uh, party in the negotiation. So in this bilateral monopoly situation, there are many ways in which the total surplus from the match, so what is gained from sticking together as a firm and a worker, um, can be split. And in fact, there are infinitely many ways in which that surplus can be split. So we are going to introduce uh, a wedge function. So the wedge function will be a function that tells us in our model, how the surplus between the worker and the firm is split depending on um, you know, labor market conditions and uh, the labor market uh, parameters. Okay? Um, and because there are many possible choices, we're going to explore different wage functions and we're going to try to see um, you know, what, this, uh, what the properties of these functions are and what these different wage functions imply for the behavior of the model. Uh, so before we uh, start, so uh, something that's good to keep in mind is just to remind ourselves in the real world, like what are the um, institutions, what are the regulations that could, exp you know, that could be at the source of a uh, wage setting. So what we saw earlier, we saw that you could have regulations that impact wages paid by firms such as the minimum wage. You have institutions that impact wages paid by firms such as labor unions, but you also have managerial practices that are going to that could impact the wages set by firms such as efficiency wage theories that um, postulate that if the firm pays a higher wage to its workers, the workers will be more productive and more faithful to the firm for a variety of reasons. Um, so in the background, all these things could uh, um, all these things could lead to different um, wages. So here we're now um, kind of moving to the labor market model and try to formalize how wages, um, the shape that wages uh, may take in our model. So the simplest, uh, the simplest form um, that the wage could take would be a completely rigid wage, if you want, a fixed wage. So that would be um, a fixed wage. So in that case, the wage function is just saying that the wage, I'm sorry, excuse me. So in that case, with the fixed wage, we assume that the wage W is just a parameter. And um, it doesn't 
change over time. Okay, so it doesn't change when other parameters change, such as productivity or the job separation rate, um, and it doesn't change when, uh, say, labor market conditions, such as the labor market tightness change. So we won't have any response to other uh, parameters and also it, it doesn't respond to um, endogenous variables in the model. So it's going to be a fixed wage. Uh, so if you have a look at the readings, that the wage function that's used by a uh, whole. In the 2005 AER paper um, that's assigned as a reading. Okay? Um, and um, so, what are the advantages of having a fixed wage as a wage function? Um, well, there are several advantages here. Um, so, one advantage obviously is the simplicity of um, that um, wedge function, you know, it's as simple as possible, your wedge is just a parameter. Another advantage is that the wedge is not going to respond to anything and as a result what we'll see is that, so that's a wedge that is um, very, what we call, rigid. And um, so when we say the wedge is rigid, it means that it doesn't respond to exter uh, external factors. And that's going to be very uh, uh, useful because as we've seen, you know, when shocks are going to hit um, the labor market, labor demand, labor supply, the wedge is not going to absorb this shock. And as a result, the labor supply, labor demand are going to respond a lot to this shock. And so we'll be able to generate uh, fluctuations of unemployment and vacancies in the labor market. So that's going to be helpful when we're trying you know, to mimic what we see on the real labor market. So the wedge is not going to absorb and as a result, so you, unemployment, vacancy, tightness, uh, they will be very um, volatile as we see in the data. So, um, because what we have in mind is to try to mimic what we see on the labor market where we see that unemployment vacancies, tightness are moving a lot around the business cycle, having a wage that's very rigid, that does not absorb shocks, um, it's going to be a useful feature. And in fact, it's for that reason that Bob Hall uh, in his 2005 paper introduced that, uh, that wage function. Okay? Um, so we have both an analytical convenience that the model that this wage function is very simple and also it's going to be useful empirically. So that would be the simplest possible uh, wage function. Now, one issue with that wedge function, so what's a disadvantage? Well, the main disadvantage is that um, in practice, if you look at how uh, wages move when labor productivity varies, actually you see that wages don't move very much, but they are not completely fixed either. And in fact, what you see is that um, 
when labor productivity varies, so when workers are sometimes a bit more productive, sometimes a bit less productive, wages are going to respond somewhat to that change in productivity. So if we want a realistic model of the labor market, in particular, we want to have a realistic model of uh, wages. So we want to have a wage function that captures some properties of wages in the real world. We would like to have wages that respond somewhat to changes in productivity. And here, if we assume a fixed wage, there is none of that response. Okay, so that's something we try to want to work on. Uh, so this advantage is that in the real world, wages respond somewhat. Somewhat, we'd have to see what that means. That's a bit of a loose statement. To um, changes in um, labor productivity. Um, they are not completely fixed. 